And uh, if you asked her if she would submit a, a videotaped message for this conference, which she kindly did. And so uh, we're going to uh, we're going to view that right now. It's about four minutes, a little over four minutes long. Travis, would you mind cueing that? Great, thank you, Steve. <clears throat> so welcome back, everyone, from uh, our little lunch break. And it's my uh, uh, great privilege to be asked to moderate this section on civilian military cooperation in the Mekong subregion. So with me here on the panel today, um, starting to my left, we have Major General Ben, uh, Director General of the Military Medical Department at the Vietnam People's Army. We have um, Rear Admiral Colin Chin, who's the Command Surgeon, U.S. PACOM. My name is Alan McGill, Director of the Malaria Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Here I have Colonel Mark Fukuda, who is an active duty U.S. Army Colonel who is uh, on secondment to the CDC as a Malaria Advisor, President's Malaria Initiative in the Greater Mekong Subregion. Then I have uh, Dr. Nippon Jananamite, the Director of the Thai Bureau of Vector-Borne Diseases. And then on my far right is Dr. Ong Ti, the Director of the Myanmar National Malaria Control Program. Their more complete bios are in your, um, in your handout, so I'll re let you refer to those. But I think um, <clears throat> one of the purposes of, of today's session is to talk a little bit about the global significance of malaria in the greater Mekong subregion, in particular, P. falciparum malaria and the threat of artemisinin resistant P. falciparum malaria and that, that what that means both in the region in terms of making the operational difficulties of dealing with malaria um, harder there, but also the threat to the global eradication program that we might uh, all be envisioning. And that <clears throat> part of this is understanding that the military, um, the militaries in all these uh, countries actually uh, play a significant role both in the potential control of this but also as a risk population because um, a little bit separate from the civilian populations and not necessarily always included in the discussions that we've had within our civilian counterparts. And so that these individuals may be at higher risk because they're deployed and often into border regions for exercises and such and then can return to the non-endemic areas harboring parasites. And we really uh, would like to highlight the possibilities of civilian military coordination and cooperation in this group. And then we also don't want to forget that it is about greater um, the elimination of P. falciparum in the greater Mekong subregion, and that is a regional area. If you remove the political boundaries of the map and we just see mountains and forests and valleys and rivers, well, that's the way the parasites and the mosquitoes see it as well. There is no national boundary. And so at a certain level, we recognize national sovereignty as probably the only true uh, constant in terms of a global health architecture, but how do we rise above national sovereignty when needed for these regional cooperative efforts? So let me um, just um, ask um, Admiral Chen to start off the discussion with some remarks. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. McGill, again, thank you for the introduction. Also, I'd like to thank Dr. Morrison and CSIS for one, inviting me 
to uh, come to the, the, the seminar you're having, but also uh, to be a panel member. So I, I greatly appreciate that. So you may be wondering, is, is, uh, why is uh, U.S. Pacific Command, why is U.S. Pacific Command surgeon um, uh, interested and, and involved in this, this uh, problem, this uh, artemisinin-resistant uh, malaria problem in, in the greater uh, Mekong subregion? So over a year ago, uh, we were approached, my office was approached uh, by the Global Fund to see if we can assist in, in the overall effort that, that they were leading. And I, abs I said absolutely once I found out more about the problem, because I'm a gastroenterologist. Um, so last time I was worrying about uh, malaria uh, and learning about it was over 30 years ago when I was at medical school or when I was at the Hopkins School of Public Health uh, learning, learning about that. But when you become a gastroenterologist, those things sort of uh, go back to the wayside. But luckily, I still had some uh, brain cells that remembered uh, my malaria teaching. So that brought the focus back to me, the importance and it has become one of my, uh, my priorities as the PACOM surgeon uh, to be involved in this. Because if you look at it, um, uh, the US military has been involved in, in, in malaria for, for decades. It goes back to the uh, you know, turn of the century, uh, you know, at the start of the 20th century, um, that we realized in the areas that the US military operates, uh, as well as in today, in exercises and operations that we are operating in, in, in countries that have a malaria problem and that potentially could uh, be a forced health protection uh, a problem or challenge for us, as you heard from Dr. Smith this morning. So that is a, uh, the basic reason why the uh, uh, Department of Defense is, is interested, but also um, it's also important for us as, uh, at U.S. PACOM because we're also in, very interested in, in, uh, in health engagement with our, our allied and partner nations as well as to help them to uh, build their capacity to address problems such as this. So those are the major things. And so we were asked by the Global Fund to participate because they realize that we do have some relationships uh, with uh, many of the countries in the area and, and to help get them, those uh, military medical departments, interested as well in this problem so they can come to the table with their counterparts in their, in their Ministry of Health, because in some, in some instances, um, that may not be something that occurs on, on an everyday basis. So they asked me if I could um, make my, as I did with Mr. Major General Bin, to talk to him, and, and, uh, and he was very receptive to that, to that concept, as well as his Ministry of Health. So that was, uh, again, a, a, a large basis of, of, of our involvement. And also uh, the realization, as, as you mentioned, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Miguel mentioned, that these militaries, as, as we know, the, the, um, the endemic regions for the uh, resistance strains is in the border regions. And this is the areas where the militaries operate uh, uh, because they, they work in, in the border regions. Uh, and and as, as Dr. Miracle said, they, they uh, travel back and forth. And so there, that's a potential conduit for transmission of, of the disease from, from the board, their borders, perhaps to their larger cities. So that's, that's obviously of, of great concern. But also, as, as we have found out, that uh, the militaries also may be the only major source of health care in these regions. And they also, as we've discovered, they also uh, may take care of a significant proportion of the civilian population in, in these border regions. And uh, some of the numbers that we've uh, discovered is up to 30 to 50%. Of the, of the healthcare could be um, uh, uh, provided by, by, the, uh, by the military. So again, sort of um, emphasizes the need for, in my opinion, for the military to be, uh, to be uh, part, part of the discussion and, and part, of the, uh, part of the solution. I, my, my personal belief is that to uh, have a successful uh, national strategy to eliminate uh, uh, malaria for the reason I just sort of cited, that the militaries uh, need to be involved in, in discussions and in, in developing the, uh, the national st uh, strategies. So, um, so with that in mind, uh, over the past year, uh, we have had uh, two uh, conferences. There was first in, in, in Da Nang in June of last year, uh, hosted by the, the Global Fund, and we were a participant. And then in August, uh, two months later, uh, PACOM with the Armed Forces Health Surveillance uh, Center also hosted a uh, conference in, in Cambodia. 
in which, again, we had um, representatives from both Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Health uh, who came to the same table, came to the same venue, and had a great, great discussion. Uh, everyone we, we, you know, shared what the challenges were, uh, what their uh, you know, populations at risk were. So good, good initial uh, sharing of information and the, uh, the plan for the for going forward is to continue that effort again with our partners with uh, you know, Global Fund, President's Malaria Initiative, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and, and World Health Organization. And then my final uh, comment would be the other area that we have concern, <coughs> you sort of heard that I think in the, in the opening session, is that our realization that many of the militaries in, this, uh, in, in the uh, uh, greater sub, uh, Mekong sub-region also send uh, peace, peacekeeping forces to Africa. So obviously there's, there's the potential uh, transmission of this strain of malaria to Africa, which I think would be a, a global catastrophe that I think we could prevent. And so our interest is, is, is working uh, with the militaries to uh, find out more about how do they, uh, what are their pre-deployment strategies? Do they, uh, how do they uh, screen, pre-screen uh, their, their uh, service members before they deploy them? And what are the treatments uh, that they're giving, if, if again, for, for malaria. And so we are starting in some initial private um, uh, pilot uh, projects to, to, uh, to work that. So that's a uh, very, very brief summary is our contribution to the effort. And, I get, and again, I look forward to any questions that you have uh, my way as, as we proceed with the panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Admiral Chen. Maybe I next turn to uh, Colonel Fukuda to make some comments in uh, his current role. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, yeah, I'd like to echo many of the comments that uh, Admiral Chin and you, Alan, have articulated from my uh, experience, both from being uh, having experience in our own military health system as, as well as now in the position of working with PMI, is that I understand that malaria is uh, that our risk that we face in uh, our own military uh, is very common with the risks and the perceptions of, of how to address the, the issue in foreign militaries and that, in fact, there is more to be shared in the experience of in common between uh, our military as well as between militaries uh, in the region. Um, like, like our military, uh, there's a job to do. They're on mission. Uh, unit commanders have to be apprised of the importance for malaria prevention and control measures and that malaria, comprehensive malaria control has to span beyond simply being viewed as a medical, a medical issue. We famously, every once in a while, have uh, unfortunate cases in the US military where we are on a deployment and the simple preventable measures are not, are not taken. Uh, and then we, um, we have the unfortunate circumstance of either uh, having deaths or what have you for a disease that can be, could have been diagnosed with a $2 rapid diagnostic test. So in, in that regard, I think in, uh, to push the awareness, the diagnostics and treatment capabilities down to the lowest possible level that uh, prevents that from occurring, that takes uh, the uh, occupational force, the military, out of its traditional mission role so they can be returned to duty is a common, a common interest uh, in our military and uh, in our partner militaries. Um, it is... Uh, uh, worthwhile to keep in mind that that's the way that we'll make the best, I believe, um, uh, progress with our partner militaries is to, in, in many of the same ways with private sector engagements, uh, occupational um, plantation workers, for example, the, the interest, their interest is to stay on the job as long as possible. The plantation owner wants a healthy workforce. Our militaries want a healthy workforce. And that's, that's really the way to approach this, uh, this problem. Thanks, Mark. Uh, great comments. I just take this opportunity to note that one of the papers that was written for this meeting is actually written by Mark, and is, uh, it's about the contributions of the DOD to malaria elimination in the Mekong. And then also take a note that uh, Chris Plough also wrote a, a paper on artemisinin resistance for this <coughs> conference. Those will be available to you, and I encourage you to read them. So let me uh, turn to my left here and ask uh, Major General Ben to make some comments on the perspective of Vietnam and the Vietnam People's Army. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. It's my uh, it's, uh, second time in uh, Washington. 
Uh, now let me uh, share some lessons we learned from the military civilian cooperation uh, is the last time. Uh, for more understanding to the, the cooperation is good or not good, uh, let me uh, first, uh, uh, first of all to uh, present to you some reason from our military uh, mal malaria uh, prevention uh, from the last time. Uh, Vietnam is uh, in the last uh, 20 years uh, highly successful history against malaria. So I can uh, give you some uh, data from this. Uh, dramatic decrease in malaria, for example, 1990.8 percentage mortality reduce, re redu reduction from, one, uh, from the 1991 until now. Uh, for example, in 1991, there are more than 4,646 deaths per year. But in last year, in 2013, there are just only six deaths uh, in the year. And the 97, 97 percentage case re reduction from 1991 uh, until now. Uh, in 2000, there are 270,910 cases. But uh, in 2013, there is only 35,406 cases. Uh, so in, uh, uh, inside of the uh, mili military, uh, under, in the last five years, there is no death uh, inside our military. And uh, um, several malaria cases, uh, there, there is only one case per year. And, uh, and malaria cases rate were 1,000 soldiers, less than 1.3. And uh, uh, until now, is we have no malaria outbreak. So we learn from uh, some lesson uh, from this uh, reason, or some factors resulting in our success. Uh, we uh, we, deep, uh, we, uh, we uh, establish very strong commitment of leadership and involvement of all level of government and communities. Uh, for example, we have a, a national malaria, malaria uh, national program again uh, uh, for malaria uh, uh, protection, and uh, we have a steering committee uh, from uh, inside the military, and uh, we have a, a milit um, malaria prevention center in uh, many level in province. In each province, there is there is one malaria prevention centers. So they're looking for the malaria control inside of the uh, province. And uh, our military, we have a, a steering committee uh, for malaria control. And we, we meet each other two years, uh, two times per year. And we get a report from cases and follow up and providing, providing strategy against malaria. And uh, now we have uh, more than 25 military uh, uh, hospital. We deploy countrywide, and they, uh, the, each hospital, they have a duty, the job to looking for the malaria cases surrounding uh, where the hospital uh, deploy. And we have, uh, there are more than 400 military care health service, uh, especially in the, uh, along to the borders. So these uh, forces belong to the uh, border guards. So they're looking for the military, um, uh, malaria cases in the population that's surrounding there. And uh, very important is uh, most of this, uh, they deploy in the remote areas in the Iceland and some areas of uh, uh, poverty. So where the people living and poor education and poor uh, environment, uh, uh, the they military forces provide the healthcare service and provide the uh, program for the malaria control, and some we provide medication for free to people living there. So the other point is that we have a very good uh, civilian and military cooperation. Uh, uh, in the last time, the chief of military uh, uh, department uh, uh, take a, the same position like a vice minister of health. So they have two functions, one is military and one is a uh, um, minister of health. So we have uh, some uh, uh, the uh, military, myself, is the member 
of the uh, national program for uh, malaria pre uh, prevention. And we have co cooperation with the military medical doctors, with uh, civil doctors in any areas where they deploy. So uh, in the last time, we had some co cooperation with the international from the Global Fund and some with the Australian Defense Force for project for long 10 years. And now we are improving and establish the cooperation with the Navy, uh, US Navy. Uh, so from this one, but uh, for the next future, we still have to uh, uh, face with uh, some challenges for the malaria elimination. Uh, for example, in uh, some region in Vietnam, in uh, Central Highland and Southeast of Vietnam, is still prevalent some uh, belong to the malaria uh, epidemic. And uh, immigration uh, and malaria. Uh, in Vietnam now is uh, per year there are mi uh, nearly two million people. Uh, uh, they belong to large mobile population, and more than one thousand five hundred, uh, one hundred fifty thousand, they move to the southeast of Vietnam and in the Central Highland, and more than eighty five thousand they are living now in Africa, in uh, Middle East and Mekong rivers. Uh, Mekong rivers. So all of them, uh, they are on the risk of malaria. So we, uh, we have some problem with uh, malaria, drug resistant with artemisinins. And uh, the rate between from the 14 and 231 percentage from some studies in these areas. So our strategy for the next future is that we have uh, keep our good lesson we have. And we have uh, more cooperation with the civilian and uh, military. And uh, in, in our military, the, the left cases, uh, infected malaria cases, most of them is uh, we cannot follow up the cases. So our next strategy is we develop our case follow-up system. So when we can uh, improve this system, so we can go closer, closer to malaria elimination. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, General Ben. Very nice comments. Um, let me turn to my... Um, my right here, and Dr. Nippon um, Chinanawit, the director of the Thai Bureau of Vector Borne Diseases. Yes. <clears throat> in Thailand, the majority of treatment malaria is a civil, it's not a military. But uh, in the past, uh, when, when you have the soldier infect with the malaria, we go to the uh, public health hospital. And, and now they have a uh, Unit from the military to treat men Maria in, in the, the military, and I will call with the, themselves with the, to support every equipment sometime or something to when you request not at, as usual. When um, and and have to when when you I get to the goal of eliminate uh, in Thailand in the last year. I will cooperate with the Army, Army Medical Department to send. And you have a uh, concern with the, have in the future, we will cooperate with the military, with the civilian to, uh, uh, to eliminate go in there. And when, when in the past, I have to, Thailand have the many cases of uh, Myanmar, Thai border have many cases, and the Thai, Myan, uh, Thai Cambodia, is a is a medicate, and in the last year have the medicate in the Thai Rao and and, and Cambodia is a south south of Rao and Cambodia and, and the northeast of the in from the uh, to have the illegal cut wood and the is and the infect from this outbreak has about it uh, about is a in the thirty percent in this year is from this area have the irrigal cutting wood is not uh, in fact. It's uh, not live in endemic area, it's not in indigenous care in this, in, no indigenous care in this community in this last year. I think it's up to, when in the future, we will get, and, by, and we got with the uh, military to set up with the, to clinical practice guideline to treat men Maria, Again, and, and I think it's after some area to have the resistance for artisanate. Mm -hmm. I will to shoot you to, to, to 
uh, use the Antimer duct. Now, in Thailand, you use the ACT regimen from the artisan, uh, artisanine and, and, and primaquine and chloroquine. It's not used the DHA piperaquine. Uh, DHA piperaquine in, in Thailand is uh, to, to pirate to treatment, it's not uh, used everything. Every. And in the area, I have the resistance, uh, have to some area in the Thai Myanmar border and some area in the Thai Cambodia border. It's no this is done in the Thai Rao. It's no have evidence for the Thai Rao evidence. In this year, I um, will study for the resistance in, in Thai Rao. It's a uh, Ubolachatani province uh, near Thai Rao. Um, in this year, I was study for the resistance uh, for artisan in, in this year. I think it's uh, military is covered with a uh, civilian in, in the future is a core in important but but it have the i think it's a for supportive for the uh, policy maker to decision for everything in the past uh, the budget for support maria in the in the 10 years ago is a have is a, about the 7 700 baht in, in the past, in the ten, in two, two, 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. In this year, it's a from the, to, to Thailand, it's have to operate court, it's about it, uh, 10, or, 10 or 20 baht, a million baht in Thailand, mm -hmm. for a million. But I think it's have to, when you, when you want to, to uh, eliminate Maria, you have the special project for, to set up the Maria, uh, European Maria in Thailand. And Deputy of Permanent Secretary of uh, Public Health, he have important to, you will to set up this uh, project in this year. And uh, too long in 10 years ago, I think it's have to set up and to eliminate goal in the Thailand in the future. And I think it's a uh, uh, medical department, it work with the uh, Ephraim and everyone too, but I is a, I know everything <laughs> you Ephraim and the, the, you. I will is coordinate with sharing from information and to try treatment and everything. I think it's a, in, important to eliminate with with my team in the Thailand. And I think it's have to to recommend for the policy and to everything to to adjust in 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 your book to recommend. I think it's uh, important for me to take activity as an uh, advocate for my boss to take action from this, the comment from the book in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. T, and this is uh, from <coughs> Myanmar, and Myanmar is up until maybe you know, 10 years ago, clearly had one of the highest burdens of falciparum malaria in the greater Mekong subregion still has a high burden, but there's been remarkable progress in just the last three or four years. And so, please. Yes, thank you. Actually, the Myanmar, uh, among the uh, sub mega re region, the malaria is decreasing, but still uh, the most prevalent uh, country in this Mekong region. Uh, around 70% of malaria cases belong to Myanmar. This, uh, and also now the Mekong region, sub region, great, the GMS is aiming to get elimination by 2030. Uh, this, somebody said this is too ambitious because we have a lot of malaria in compared with Thailand and other GMS countries. And also uh, in concern with the civilian and military cooperation, you know, to get eliminations, the one of the assumptions is um, social and political stability is very much important. But you know that in Myanmar, there's the longest civil war is still present off and on. They, sometimes they fight and sometimes they talking about peace. And and also the most of the uh, like the, the state military and the ethnic group army, they're fighting along the border, China-Myanmar border, and also China-Myanmar border. 
there's a little bit difficult to control uh, the malaria also. And also the military person are at risk of getting malaria. And also they are risk for sign because they are, because uh, our, our uh, control program is emphasizing on the this migrant and mobile population. And also the military groups are also migrant and mobile frequently. And also they are <coughs> carrying infection to place to place. That's why the, the military personnel are also a risk for sign for, uh, to target for the malaria elimination. And, and also, like, the, the, the military, they have their, ori their orientation, vision and mission is uh, the military operational orient vision. And that's why that's, they, they are for the like a uh, malaria operation and also data sharing. Uh, they keep for security and the secret. secret. That's why we need, we need to negotiate between the civilian society, civilian and military to, to, to get the malaria elimination in the future. <coughs> and also as a, like a national program, because uh, mili uh, in Myanmar, military, uh, we have a very good relation between Defense Service Medical Research Unit making some study and research together with the support of Global Fund now. But the difficulty is they have their, uh, their own treatment policy. Because then our national malaria control program not practicing the chemo prophylaxis, but the military, they are practicing chemo prophylaxis. There's one difference to negotiate and also they have their own strategy. But we, <coughs> we need to be thinking about that. Not a military also as a, like a good partners for National Malaria Control Program. We need to make a uh, treatment, we need to negotiate and discuss for the treatment policy and also <coughs> coordinated, coordinated uh, strategic plan and also uh, strategic plan and also the action plan together with military and also civilian side. And also, mo most of the border area are occupied by uh, military. Uh, there's this, uh, some civilian personnel cannot reach. The, and also, the outreach personnel are the, in the area of the military strategy area. And also, the border checkpoint are uh, cons uh, also under the mil military. That's why if we, uh, we discuss with the military to, to become a like, good partner with same or, same or modifying a coordinated strategic plan. Uh, we, we can do faster for the like, checking and for a checkpoint and also the, <coughs> the outreach area covered by military can get the, uh, our malaria elimination plan operated by military. That's why we need to develop and coordinate strategy plan and action plan for the, to do what malaria elimination. Uh, and also we need to think about not only the government military and also et ethnic group army. That's it, we call non-state ETA. They, they are also managing malaria control and control activities in, along the Bora area especially in the Thailand Myanmar border. <laughs> That's why we, we, we also think about the military and also other non-state actors to involve in, as a partner with the same goal and the coordinated uh, strategy and energy plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Dr. T. The, um, so just thinking a little bit about this, there were some comments made earlier about the Global Fund, and I'd be very uh, curious to know, um, five years ago, I would have thought it would be impossible to conceive the Global Fund, Global Fund would actually sponsor and host a meeting about talking about the military, uh, working, uh, working with the militaries in the greater Mekong subregion. Um, what do you think 
helped contribute to that, what seems to me a little bit of a shift of focus um, based on, and I'm sure some of, many of you were at that uh, session, and how do you think, and the Global Fund is one of the biggest multilateral donors in malaria, um, typically working only with the civilian population, but now seeming to embrace the military as, as a population within these communities. And maybe uh, Admiral Chen, if you want to uh, make a comment there or an observation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I guess I can uh, start that conversation. Um, so I, I wasn't there during the initial, you know, sort of in invitation uh, to PACOM, but um, I, I was aware that this was this was new ground, you know, for for the Global Fund, and so, and I also think in, in DoD that you know we're, we're changing how we're uh, operating because uh, I've brought to to my office. Uh, sort of more co uh, collaborative approach in which uh, not only are we trying to work with our, our uh, component services within PACOM, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, but also uh, to work more closely uh, and, and coordinate better with uh, the U.S. interagency uh, and, and be uh, you know, more transparent in what we're doing. So I think perhaps when we then came to the table at uh, those initial meetings uh, that the Global Fund hosted, uh, I, I think we surprised them with that approach, perhaps, and again, I don't want to speak for, for, for those folks from the Global Fund, but that was the approach that I came in there, is, is we want to be partners, uh, we want to work as, as a, you know, a, a coordinated effort uh, with everyone, and perhaps that um, approach has been, uh, has been well received. Great, thank you. Mark, any uh, observations? You've been in that region for a long time. <laughs> Well, I, I think it just has to do with the population at risk, and uh, the population at risk is uh, is military. That is the population that has to be addressed. It's uh, in many ways uh, parallel to the uh, conversations this morning about the role of the private sector. It's a different health health system where um, uh, you would need to take a different approach in order to reach populations that seek care in the private sector. There are different distribution mechanisms, different motivations. Uh, so uh, that, cannot, that sector cannot be ignored, uh, and nor I think can the military be ignored. It's, it's all part of the drive to fine-tuning approaches so that we really are reaching uh, end-of-the-mile populations that truly demonstrate need. Um, so one of the things I'd be curious to hear from our, our colleagues from the region what exactly are some of the challenges? We talk about mil-civ and civ-mil interactions, but then reducing that to, well, what exactly does that mean? Um, does it mean data sharing? Well, that's, you know, sharing data from the military is always going to be problematic because of operational security concerns and other issues. That's generally not what militaries do is broadcast their deployment postures around the world. Um, and is it best technical practices? Is it um, the at-risk at populations need different tools or strategies? Just so from your perspective, maybe start with you, General Ben. Uh, when we say military-civilian cooperation or coordination, what exactly does that mean to you? And what do you need from the civilian sector? And what do you think you can provide from the military sector back? Uh, I, I don't know how about the other countries. But uh, I think it's in my countries, the cooperation between military and civilian very s smoothly. Uh, for example, now you have an inpatient in military hospital, and eight, more than 80 percent from capac capacity from hospital we open for civilian. And now in my Korean uh, countries, the, the people still trust very strong in the, from military medical service. So they come very often and they like to choose to come to the military hospital. So in the uh, uh, remote areas, it's the same. And the Ministry of Defense, they cannot touch in the any, uh, especially the, the, the um, remote areas. So they, they would like to, 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 to pass this uh, uh, task to military uh, medical service in these areas. So in my country, uh, the cooperation is very I think it's just very easy. And we can talk to each other very easy and share our burden from the healthcare requirement from the population. Great, thank you. 
But in China, in Thailand, he has a, some area he has to co a good coordinate with the military and civil. In some area, I'm not sure. In 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 some area, he have to good coordinate with uh, to work together. In, in in the same the the north east, the north east uh, near the sea again province is uh, near the uh, Thai Cambodia border. He have to work with the military and the civilian to 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 teach men and to control in in the area of the sea scape. And some area is near the Thai Myanmar border. I'm I'm not sure. To, to coordinate with the military, to coordinate with the civilian, I'm not sure. But I think it's have to sample from the Vietnam. I think it's have a good idea to with uh, some area to set the system to coordinate for the vector control or the other to to prevention and to uh, surveillance in the military. I think it's, uh, they have the civilian in, in, in military. I'm not sure we have the, uh, they look like same the civilian uh, civilian in, in, in Thailand. The uh, civilian uh, civilian in Thailand is uh, from the uh, civilian with the the work, Maria worker in, in the community to report and to set up the the uh, survey with uh, they have an outbreak or the other, and sometimes in have outbreak in. Uh, military, I'm not sure to have to survey with uh, this uh, outbreak from this. Uh, I think it's have the, in the future Thailand we start to set up with the system for the, to consult and to to check with the Thai uh, civilian and military in the for the future. Yes. Let let me add something. Uh, for example, in the some very uh, remote areas, very difficult uh, areas, we uh, establish some. Uh, we put a big name. Is civilian military medical service. <laughs> so we bring all the people from the military and civilian is working together. So improving the power, manpower in the very poor areas. Yes. So we can uh, very benefit from this yes. activation. I think it's uh, the, the the last year it has an outbreak in the in the uh, province. I I I to with the soldier in the is their area to control to protect the illegal to cut the wood on the national park. I will do the, the uh, soldier to protect this. Yeah. Um, Dr. T. And just in the again your your observations from the um, the ability of the military and civilian um, malaria groups in Myanmar to work together what works well, what can be improved? Yes, yes. Uh, in my final two, in the past, they say because of political issue, that there's no funding for the military group, only for civilian group, by global fund. Now that, that our government changed as a civilian type, the global fund like, mm, flexible to support military group to conduct malaria control and also for the containment for other resistance by military, military medical personnel. And also they are expanding their medical coverage by like, like in come, come, or, uh, Vietnam, the, the military medical unit, they expand. Not only for the military personnel, it's also for the civilians, especially for the very remote area, hard to reach area, cannot reach by uh, ordinary civilian medical service. Now, uh, the, the, the domestic funding like from the government also increasing to support the military and also civilian, uh, especially for the malaria uh, control program. Now we are face, uh, trying to get end up to the phase of malaria elimination. And also what, another problem is uh, like uh, the, they have their own vision and mission and their, their reasons uh, and also we, we you've got to get the data, and all data sharing is a one problem, and also our civilian surveillance system for malaria control is not include, in, uh, that our surveillance system not include military. That's why uh, we need to modify, and also, like, as I said, coordinated strategy plan and action plan, also cooperated, cooperated uh, action to take. That's why we need to modify our surveillance system, include all the partners, and also to get the, all the data for the program management. 
this, we need to uh, strengthen our surveillance system and also modify SM. Okay, thank you. It kind of strikes me hearing some of the comments that you could take this, um, unpack this military civilian a little more in the sense that, you know, the first step is I call it as a malaria-free military. Right? That's yeah. sort of the first mm -hmm. step. Yeah. Whether it's the American military or Vietnam or Thailand or Myanmar, the first step is that your military is free and then mm -hmm. uh, malaria free mm -hmm. and then you say well what exactly is the boundary of that we all recognize that you have your quote active duty component which is the men and women in uniform but then often there's um, a surrounding dependent there are families and groups that depending on the country and the military can actually even deploy with the military members mm -hmm. so really defining the boundary of what's malaria free um, that's the base, and then you build up, there's a certain level of just say coordination and cooperation, which is data sharing. Mm -hmm. um, where actually are you collecting cases? What's happening? Sharing best practices. Um, is there a forum by which the Vietnam People's Army and the Myanmar military and Thailand and Cambodia and Laos, for example, the militaries can get together and share best practices? Mm -hmm. um, for years, and I think we still do that, um, NATO forces get together on a routine basis with the militaries and we'll actually share. We'll talk to our British and French and Italian, German colleagues, mm -hmm. and we'll share best practices and also worst practices, which happens sometimes, um, amongst each other because we learn from each other. And then I was struck by your comment, General Ben, about, well, what's that next level, which is almost integration, which mm -hmm. is this combined civilian military yeah. mm -hmm. intervention, which is then you use the strengths yeah. of both organizations mm -hmm to accomplish a shared goal. And I was thinking of the, uh, you know, this is again at a regional effort. This often comes down to the border regions. Mm -hmm. And the border regions and all the countries I think share certain features which are, um, it's an area where ethnic minority groups tend to be higher mm -hmm. in numbers and diversity. Mm -hmm. And for various reasons, maybe because they're ethnic minorities and often just the remoteness, the geographic remoteness, they tend to be underserved. Mm -hmm and that the military can often bring one of its greatest strengths, which is logistics, mm -hmm. manpower, transportation, all the things that are really yeah. sort of hard to do, and yet the military can do them very well, totally. in combination with our civilian colleagues to help deliver care. Mm -hmm. And I recall uh, you know, a few years ago when the tsunami hit Indonesia, mm -hmm. and there was a massive global response, and part of the American response was actually the deployment of the Navy ships, the, the Mercy and the Comfort, staffed by Army, Navy, and Air Force doctors and legions of civilian doctors. It really was a combined military-civilian um, mission on the part of the United States in that area. So you can see this uh, spectrum across from a malaria-free military, which is a start, and where it makes sense to have the joint military-civilian integration. Maybe just uh, to pick on the Americans a little bit, um, I'll, I'll just throw this out to Mark. Uh, how does military civilian coordination work in the US between the military and the civilian and the CDC? What, what works well, what could be improved? And our CDC colleagues are here, but they're not on the stage, so we'll let them go. It's very good. Well, Alan, it's perfect. <laughs> no deficiencies whatsoever. It's, it's a good answer. Well, I think, I think, you know, this idea of data sharing between, uh, uh, I, I was at the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Center, which is the DOD's CDC equivalent um, at that time. One of the early activities that we uh, tried to do is to integrate the uh, military data for cases that came through the military health system on an annual basis so they were not double counted uh, and that they were integrated as part of the domestic branch, CDC's domestic branch, uh, annual um, numbers that are reported every, every year in their MMWR. I am humbled to say that that did not happen until approximately 2010, uh, where there was a formal agreement in place so that we would provide annualized data. But that's you, that the half glass full approach, of, you say, now that practice uh, occurs. There's always an opportunity to refine the way data are shared to deduplicate those data, but that that practice is there uh, and is is occurring. 
So I would say maybe better late than never. That's better only about 75 never. years after the establishment of the two organizations, but that's okay. Um, so I, I think it just highlights the fact that, yes, in the United States, we have our own challenges about integrating and working in military civilian. And they're not because the two organizations don't share the same goals and same missions. It's just the typical bureaucracies of organizations is they grow up, you have your own reporting systems and such, and it does take a little bit of a conscious effort to reach out and, and share in that common goal. Um, also, I, th I think one point, um, and then we'll open it up for some questions from the floor, is this uh, concept, and you know, for most of the years I was in the military, the driver was very much um, protect the warfighter, right? That's, that's what the military mission was, protect the warfighter. Makes total sense, right? And that's why the military mission was distinct and separate from the civilian mission or the global health mission. What I've seen in the last uh, maybe five to 10 years, and maybe much so or more so in just the last few, is this concept that the, the military, um, as we say, protect the warfighter. I mentioned this this morning. The best way to protect the warfighter is to eradicate malaria. If there is no malaria, then that's one more issue in force health protection that the military just doesn't have to deal with. <coughs> And um, I certainly believe and I sense from many of my colleagues that there's a growing awareness that that actually sh should be the ultimate goal of all militaries, whether it's Vietnam or the Americans or Myanmar or whatever, is the actual, the shared goal of eradication because that benefits everyone. So maybe I'll start with you, with, uh, Admiral Chen. Is this, how has your thinking on this evolved over the last few years from maybe say when you were 10 or 15 years ago until now? And, how do you see this uh, eradication as actually a truly shared goal of all the militaries and our civilian community? So I would say I would share with you that that this is definitely you know, something in evolution. When I first you know started you know 30 years ago, it was clearly all about like you said it was force health protection. Uh, that is our mission from, from a military medical perspective, and and that's what we do, and and we don't go beyond that. I now come into my position at PACOM you know, 30 years later, and that's still, it is still my number one mission. However, it has expanded uh, tremendously. Um, and and uh, so, like I said, why, while that force health protection piece is my, my number one mission, what I spend most of my time on, however, is global health engagement, you know, working with my partners such as uh, General Ben in, 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 in uh, in Vietnam, as well as counterparts in Thailand, throughout throughout Asia, um, I spent a lot of time because that's what Admiral Locklear is asking me to do, to execute his uh, 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 theater campaign security cooperation plan. Um, so I, I think you're seeing a, an evolution in the thinking within the Department of Defense. And um, I was last week I was at the uh, there's an APSIS conference over at the Washington Convention Center. And Dr. Woodson is now talking about his new pillars of, of, uh, of focus, of emphasis for the military health system. And one of the major pillars now is global health, which, again, I don't think we saw that in the past. So, so I think that's the, that's the uh, uh, a new direction. I, I, I could totally concur with this direction. It, it totally ties into, again, the national uh, or the international global health security agenda uh, effort. I think Ebola has been very helpful in really raising the global awareness that this is something we do need to do. And we do need to help um, as, as a global community uh, achieve the international health regulations. And I can't think all these things, I, I say, tie into that. And I get back here to this malaria effort again is tying in to that, to that whole effort. And I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of it. And maybe Mark, from you have a unique perspective in that you're a long-term active duty um, Army officer. You served at AFRAMS in the region for many years in an operational research and clinical trial setting. And now you have this sort of new role as the in the CDC President's Malaria Initiative. Um, this broader concept of does eradication as the ultimate goal for the military, does this make sense to you and resonate, and how do you relate that to maybe your past view 10 years ago? Well, certainly, I, I, I do think it makes sense for the reasons you, you've stated. Ultimately, as, uh, as Admiral Chidden is pointing out, we're concerned about protecting 
uh, the warfighter. You know, we make no bones about that being our primary mission. And I think to to say anything else would 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 be uh, disingenuous. Uh, I think that we share with that, as I said, the opening uh, of the session was that our foreign and military partners have the same interest in preserving uh, their operational capability. Now, uh, I do think that the uh, DOD has a great number of tools that have been used tra traditionally in, in the setting of, as you're pointing out, operational research. Those tools and that expertise, I think, can be used towards the purpose of public health, towards malaria elimination, uh, ultimately to the mutual benefit of our partner militaries. When you think about uh, current, current new tools that are being deployed and piloted now in the setting, in the Mekong setting, one of them is targeted uh, mass treatment, or TMT. But that's the same thing as chemoprophylaxis, which we've already heard is being widely practiced. It's been common practice in our military. So what are the drivers of compliance or non-compliance? What's the best way to pilot these? What populations in which they will work? Uh, the military uh, is in a position to study these, uh, these things. They're already being uh, used in, in militaries and will be perhaps in a position to be a learning laboratory to see what, what kinds of motivators are there so that troops ultimately comply with their chemoprophylaxis regimens and what is the transformation of that information product to the rubber tree plantation worker or other populations at risk. So yes, it's a benefit. Those, the chemoprophylaxis is an analogy for the benefit to our forces, but then there is also the benefit of how those packages interventions can be used for the benefit of other uh, at-risk populations. Maybe uh, General Ben, as the military representative here, the, how does this sort of resonate with you, or how does this fit your thinking of elimination, in this case, of uh, initially PF, but ultimately PV, um, Vivax malaria, elimination of malaria in the entire region as literally a strategic goal for the Vietnam, Vietnamese People's Army, because that removes one more um, detriment to force health protection. That's about uh, we, we try to, to have a military free from malaria. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's a good change for our military because now we have a very limitation from the malaria infection cases and most of them belong to the border guards. They deploy in the, in the border. And uh, we, we now, in the last time, we cannot uh, uh, go farther for uh, uh, elimination from malaria from these forces because we have uh, no, uh, not enough uh, capacity to follow up the cases. So this for, uh, for, for Vietnam people army, free malaria for the next future, they, uh, they looking for, we, we're looking for the imp improving the capacity for the uh, case uh, follow up. We, when when we can, can do this, so we can go, we, we can have uh, army, free, military free malaria. Great, thank you. Before I open up to broad questions from the audience, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'd like to call on a couple of colleagues to make some comments or observations, and this wasn't pre-scripted, so you'll be surprised. So, um, Pascal, Pascal Ringwald, my, my colleague from WHO, you've been working uh, tirelessly in the greater Mekong region for a decade plus. Um, what, is, what has changed in the last few years about military and civilian, and how do you see this from a WHO perspective? Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, first of all, uh, we welcome this, this new collaboration. Uh, yes, you're right. I mean, this has changed, I would say, the last five, six years. Uh, I mean, we started, uh, we started to work uh, a lot more with the military, especially that the military were involved in doing therapeutic efficacy testing. And if I can give the example of Myanmar, for instance, uh, the, the, the military based on areas where nobody else could, could uh, penetrate was a very good uh, way of getting information on the efficacy of the, the drugs in this area. Um, then, uh, what was striking when you had the, the military and the civilian around the same table is that, in fact, they were talking about the same thing but not in the same language. Um, one of the problems is that uh, they all agreed that you must use the most effective drug to treat, 
uh, the patient, but they did not use the same drugs. Uh, and they did not have the same channel of procurement. They did not have the same, etc., etc. So I think that now that they are reconciled and now uh, sitting around the same table, around the same table, they, they, are, they can now uh, coordinate and have the same goal in the same way. Uh, having the same drug, having the same policy, using the same tools, etc., and collaborating better. So, in fact, this, this, this discrepancy that we saw in the past is now resolved, and this is thanks to everything that is ongoing, and especially also with the Global Fund. This Global Fund initiative, calling these two meetings, I guess, uh, was a very good initiative and, and, and clearly showed that, that they, need, they need to collaborate closer and to, to have the same goal. Great. Thank you, Pascal. Um, next, I'd like to ask uh, Tom Kanyak, who's uh, one of my colleagues, works with me at the foundation. Tom's also been engaged in the, uh, in the work in the Greater Mekong for a long time. A long time. Uh, and with Pascal as well for a long time. And I, I, I think that, you know, Alan, you must have intercepted my text that I sent to Pascal before you called on him because I asked him to mention actually WHO's involvement in all this. And we've been involved in supporting the WHO with the therapeutic efficacy surveillance studies and also working with AFRAMS with the Royal Cambodian Armed Forces. I, I will state uh, what my boss's goal is, which is yours, which is that we engage more broadly with the military at the Gates Foundation as we can under uh, U.S. law. We see that also WHO and the Global Fund have been very open to now civilian military interaction. We saw this in the Da Nang meeting, which uh, Admiral Chin mentioned, which I attended, and also then the follow-on meeting that PACOM sponsored in uh, Cambodia as well. And that the idea is that actually, in speaking with both Walter Kazadi of the WHO era uh, hub and with the Global Fund, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but there could be ways to get uh, international funding for civilian-run uh, programs with the militaries. And so I think that this is something really that WHO has been a leader in exploring through their work in mobile and migrant populations and something that all of us should think about. Uh, there are, of course, uh, maybe an elephant in the room is that we can't, the American military can't work with all militaries yet of the region. But I do like your question that you did ask about the militaries of the region working with each other and how the civilians uh, both in the Ministries of Health of the Greater Mekong subregion and then from organizations such as ours and other donors can look to have under civilian control military programs that interact. And I think that Pascal really hit the nail on the head when talking about that sometimes there's a difference. Uh, it's either the uniform or the dress or the language or the culture or the acronyms that we use, but really we are talking about a common language and we are sharing a common goal. And I truly believe that if we don't eliminate malaria from the militaries of the greater Mekong subregion and elsewhere, we aren't going to ultimately achieve our goal of eradication. So thank you, Alan. Is, uh, we also worked with the UN in regarding, we talked about the, the problem of the UN peacekeepers, and especially the risk of, 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 uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, peacekeepers either uh, um, transporting um, resistance parasites to Africa or coming back with, with par parasites. And we worked with the UN, we, we, we drafted a recommendation to the UN in order to take measures of the troops before they leave Southeast Asia in order to be free of all parasites, uh, especially the artemisinin or the multidrug resistance parasite in the, in the area, in order to go back to, 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 to Africa without any risk of transmitting uh, parasites. And of course, there are also recommendations that because these people are going in an area which is a high transmission area compared to the area they are coming, all necessary recommendations when they come back to be screened and to be treated if they develop fever and if they develop malaria after return. Thanks, uh, thanks, Pascal. Uh, maybe just a couple more. I, um, I see Colin back there. Colin Ord is a uh, former colleague of mine at the uh, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. He's now living in Hanoi and actively engaged, working with several partners in Vietnam and uh, working in his new position at the University of California, San Francisco. And Colin, you're sort of at the front lines and both working in malaria and with our partners. Any thoughts on how this has evolved in your last five years? Uh, thanks, Alan. Um, I've actually been dreaming about this for the last 23 years when I was working <clears throat> on the Thai-Cambodian border and then in Cambodia. I saw that malaria could elim be eliminated and I saw that malarias um, were part of the problem and part of the solution. So now I am back in Asia, in Vietnam, 
where I'm hoping to have this dream come true. And Major General Bing, I would actually like to turn this to some questions to you. The, the first one is, is I heard that you have 400 units working with civilians on the border with Cambodia and Laos. Given resources, do, could you and the VPA actually expand this with financial resources? Maybe, maybe you should go ahead and then I'll ask you one more question. <laughs> yes, uh, until now is uh, we uh, sometimes, because of now we improve, we uh, requirement from the government to, uh, uh, to setting the national strategy military civilian program. So from this program, we can take some financing from this one. But the lab, we have take from our uh, Minister of Defense fund. With additional funding, could you do more? Uh, now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy to do more, but uh, something, sometimes, we, you know already our military uh, forces, normally they were healthy. We, we use what they have for the people the living in there, so for free. So the second question is, and first of all, it is really wonderful that you've implemented the prevention practices you have in the VPA, but I know that some of the surrounding countries don't use those same practices. Do you think you could help with Laos in particular, or potentially Cambodia or Myanmar, to change the practices to be more like Vietnam's? Yes, it's uh, a little difficult because I don't know how about the mechanism from the other countries, but I think it's our lesson. I, I found this lesson is a good lesson. So I share a lesson so we can copy not all of the lesson. You can take part of the lesson. I think it's, we try our best to con connection with the people, our, 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 uh, our uh, countries clothing to us, and to share experiences. If they adapt it or not, uh, I, I can say. OK, thank you very much, sir. So I look very much forward to working with the Vietnamese People's Army and the other militaries in the region to help achieve the goal of global eradication. Thank you. So uh, one comment, I think it's interesting to follow up, and I've noticed this a bit when, uh, um, and this is just the nature of life and the politics, the, when NATO decides to call a meeting and you can get the Americans and the Brits and the Germans and, and Italians, they can talk about malaria eradication and shared best practices and such because it is part of a formal alliance and such. When I lived in Peru, it was, shall we say, somewhat challenging to get the Peruvians and the Ecuadorians to sit in the same room and share that because they've had a, a, a bit of a history over the century or so. And it took a third party. It took somebody like Pajo or someone, um, a neutral party to sort of hold the convening and then people can attend. And I think there's a lot of ways to achieve that shared best practice, whether it's the foundation, the global fund, uh, PACOM, there's a variety of mechanisms by which you can create these neutral forums until there's a, a more of a built up period of trust. Um, last person I'd like to call on is my friend Myang, um, because she's unique, of course, that she was born in Myanmar just a few short years ago. And, um, has a perspective maybe on the changes that have occurred in her own country and the ability to work with uh, the military. So, Myang? Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, so we have been talking about you know, how much has changed in terms of uh, military involvement in public health in general, in malaria in particular. I think, and you know, I can talk only about Myanmar, of course. Um, the change is huge. Um, now, you know, I can go into the country. I was blacklisted, and uh, so I, now I can go into the country freely, uh, almost freely, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I can work with um, anyone, really, including our military colleagues. Um, but um, I think the relationships and co you know, collaboration that we do in the name of malaria, um, it's, it's good enough to do the scientific work. But we're not just doing scientific work anymore. And, and I think that we need a lot more 
than scientific collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that is why what everyone is talking about, political will. Um, you know, half of my grant that you gave us uh, is on that. Um, but the political will is, you know, has to come from um, multiple direction coming, it has to be built, um, uh, you know, in very low level of health workers and midwives and doctors, all the way up to, um, you know, to the top leadership level in, 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 in case of Myanmar, for sure. And it has to be beyond health. Um, you know, Ministry of Health alone is not enough to take this great task of next 20, 30 years. Um, so in my perspective is that malaria work that we're doing is really not malaria work. Um, it's very much a diplomacy and a lot of uh, political negotiation and, and you know, building trust among many different factions um, and with you know, some adversary history um, for many, many years, decades. Um, and also, there's a, something that I wanted to bring up, and I have had this conversation with Tom, um, is that um, not only within the country, but the U.S.-Myanmar um, relationship. Um, I talked a little bit about with Steve um, Morrison earlier, and there's a lot of concerns, a lot of anxieties over what's going to happen um, in 2015. And I think that, that we as a scientific um, community be proactive in that. I mean, how do we protect our baby of malaria elimination from what will, um, can happen, um, you know, and that the complex uh, relationship between, um, you know, Myanmar and, and other countries, including, of course, the US, um, can kill it. Um, that, that can kill um, you know, our effort to, to eliminate malaria. And um, you know, we, this, this conversation has been going on for some time now. Um, it has become reality. Um, and so this is something that I want to, the question that I want to raise for everyone in this room and particularly um, you know, the US um, federal institutions who want to work um, very you know, actively in, in Myanmar. Um, I don't know if I answer your question, but uh, <laughs> no, actually, that's my quite thought. well. Actually, it's a very nice sort of um, coda or elevation of this from a from. As you're right, I think the scientific and technical um, rea uh, relationships now are, are pretty solid in most cases and building and growing. But it really has to go to this higher level of, of trust, uh, which takes time. And uh, the best way to generate trust is through shared projects and shared goals and shared experiences that develop. So I think we have a little time, not much, but a little time. Uh, questions from the audience? Start right here. There's three right in front of me, so we'll start there. We'll take a couple of questions, and then we'll... Well, thank you. On. First of all, great. this is a wonderful panel. And um, I am Andre Sobajo. Yeah. Yes, and I am a uh, director for Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and Washington, D.C. for the Interstate Traveler Company in Detroit, Michigan. And also, uh, on the political note, one of President Obama's presidential partners. Now, uh, my question, I know very well what the wonderful work that the one the, the, I mean, the, the people who are doing in Vietnam. <laughs> but what I want to ask is, on, really based on your question, Sir Dr. McGill, and also maybe to the Army Colonel. Uh, I, my question is this. You raised the question of the first of the uh, priority mission of protecting the warrior. With 27 years in the Army, I'm very aware of that and appreciate it. But my question is this, on malaria eradication and the cooperation that you raised, sir, is, the, is another barrier to achieving better U.S. military and civilian cooperation the fact that we got rid of conscription in favor of a all-volunteer force, and Joseph Califano, a former director uh, of uh, H Secretary of Health, Education, Welfare, Califano, printed a column adumbrating a increasingly bifurcated society as a result of that 
and it, that certainly has proven out in a lot of ways. But my question is on malaria, cooperation on malaria, is this a barrier, sir? Okay. Next, uh, Michael. And then Steve. Thanks very much. So just to follow up a little bit about the military and innovation, we certainly appreciate what NAMRU 2 has done, what AFRIMS is doing, what Captain Beavers and the Armed Forces Pest Management Board are doing for personal protection and application equipment, et cetera. <clears throat> but I think the Mekong region is a unique ecological situation, and then you have such very restricted transmission zones because of the nature of Anopheles dirus and Anopheles minimus. And if there's one thing that the, mili the military is famous for, it's geographic reconnaissance. And so we talked about change in the area. I think the biggest change has been the ecological change. I mean, Pei Lin looks like Iowa now with the, with the cornfields. So is the military in a position to help the National Malaria Control Programs with the delineation of the most at-risk locations, as, as Mark would say, the delineation of the transmission zones so that we can concentrate there and not worry about CSIFON or, um, or some of the other non-transmission areas. But again, thinking specifically of collaboration for targeting and geographic reconnaissance. Great, right, Steve, all right in front of you. Thanks. Um, one comment, another way of working with the military, we're working with the Indonesian military to actually do a vaccine trial of forces deployed from Java to uh, Papua, which is sort of an ideal setting for doing it. But I got a question from Admiral Chin. Um, you talked, uh, you know, and, and th there was talk about the meetings and the discussions, and we talked about human, uh, disaster relief and we have public relations with the ships going around to different countries and so on. But if I look at um, the budgets that were put up earlier about how much money is actually being invested, and I don't know what the exact numbers are in the DOD, but as far as I can tell, the percentage that's being in invested in things like malaria as compared to 10, 20 years ago has actually gone down. So. Um, I'm, and I, I'm not sure that's true, but I would ask you, you know, about that, and I realize you're not in the R&D component, but what is that, where do you see your interest, your involvement with global health actually being translated into investment by the DOD monetarily in actually helping to solve the problem? So maybe actually, uh, Admiral Chen, if you want to just take that question directly, we'll go three, two, one, and uh, you want to... Okay. Try to respond to Steve there. So I can actually, uh, let me answer question number two first, and I can actually, I'll answer the question, but I also have one of my uh, experts in my office in the audience who's uh, got all the details. But the answer is yes, we can do, and I think we are doing, that geographical zone uh, reconnaissance that you asked for. But uh, Commander Danny Shaw or anyone else who's uh, involved in that? Yeah, so we have experts, so we have uh, two units that can do that. We have the Navy uh, uh, Expedition Preventive Medicine Unit uh, 6, which is based in, in Hawaii, and then the Army has uh, their uh, Army uh, Public Health Center uh, station in, in, uh, in uh, Japan. Who They have experts that, you know, we can, if uh, the demand signal is out there, we can uh, ask them to do, do exactly what, what you're asking. So that capability is out there, and we're also also on doing that, because that actually then ties back into their, that's the type of mission that they need to do, and ties right back into that force health protection. It ties back into uh, helping protect uh, US, US service members. And, and the answer again, um, uh, Alan's question about is elimination uh, becoming a priority, uh, malaria elimination becoming a priority for uh, a DOD? I think the answer, if, you, if you've been here from the beginning of this, um, uh, seminar, you're hearing it multiple times from multiple different sources. It is becoming uh, a theme that's out there. Right. Uh, and then now to answer the question, again, yes, I'm not an R&D expert. Um, that's, that's a great question, great challenge, especially in these uh, fiscally challenged times. You know, we're, we're uh, um, you know, looking at 2016, you know, another, you know, sequestration uh, bogey is going to come out there, and how's that going to hit us? Um, uh, you have heard me mention that, yes, it's become one of Dr. Woodson's um, 
uh, pillars for, for global health engagement, but yes, it's, it's to be seen whether or not that is then going to translate into um, dollars in a future POM. And, and so I'm not in a position, I'm not in those discussions. Uh, obviously from my, where I'm sitting, obviously I, I'd love to see that happen, but again, I'm not in the uh, part of the budget uh, side. I can put in requests uh, from PACOM, and under the current, uh, current uh, budget cycle, um, I have input into uh, those sources of funding that PACOM has oversight over that can be directed to, toward global health engagement activities, and we have been successful uh, to date in, in, in getting that type of funding towards these type of efforts. We will see whether or not, you know, in the next couple of years, that's gonna be able to continue. I, I have had to adjust uh, some of our projects that we can um, support based, based on the budget, so. It's sort of the best that I can answer your question without not being totally in the, uh, the process here in DC. Uh, I guess the question for this whole group was how can we help? <laughs> I mean, that's how can we help, you know, try to have more money allocated into the other things, you know, through efforts, you know, of uh, lobbying and so on and so forth. Right. The, just a follow on question there from Steve was how can those of us in the audience? who are no longer in the employ of the US federal government help our colleagues. Because as we know, all of our colleagues in the federal government completely support our president's budget as requested. <coughs> the, uh, and I just sort of answer your question, I'll just, because I know we're running out of time, um, just say that I don't actually think that the current, and this is a personal view, but the all volunteer army versus the conscript army actually uh, makes a difference, and in fact, in any, many ways, I think it actually is, um, it actually makes things better in some ways, because if, if you look at, um, you know, polls and surveys across the U.S. population today, there aren't many aspects of government, particularly the federal government, that get approval marks, anything north of 50 percent, except the U.S. military. The U.S. military continues to get extremely high marks across the board. It's perceived as actually does a good job, pretty expensive, but does their job and does it well and does it with pride. And I think that carries over to all the missions that the U.S. military would take forward. And I, I think it would add great credibility if the military as a U.S. government agency did its role. It's not to say that, as you say, force health protection of the active force is, is key. But as I would say, really the long-term goal here, there's only one way to protect the force, and that's to eradicate malaria. Um, Steve, I think we're probably running out of time. Yep. So let me uh, stop, and I want to thank all of our panel members, but in particular, General Ben, Dr. T, and Dr. Chinaway. Um, these individuals have flown from across the uh, ocean, if you will. They're jet lagged, and they're here speaking in a foreign language. So if I were in... Um, Hanoi or Nipidao or Bangkok trying to speak in their language, let's say how, how well would that go? <laughs> so uh, a big thank you to all of our uh, speakers and their comments, and thanks to Steve and CISS for having us here. Thank you.